Hey everybody, it's Christine Garvin and welcome to this special holiday edition of Hormonally Speaking. If you're watching this video on YouTube, you can see I have my sweet, sweet headphones on so that you can hear me a little bit better. I've been doing a lot of these interviews, you know, without um, headphones and, and, and speaker, just kind of using the computer speaker. And I know that's not always the best quality. So I'm moving and switching. I am looking for a better headset that's not so obvious as this one, but that will come in time. So I want to welcome you today where it's a special episode to me because it's um, with just me and myself and I and not with anyone else. Um, and I have to admit that that makes me nervous. It's definitely not my comfort place or space to really, um, you know, kind of talk about a lot of things without having um, another person to kind of bounce back and forth with the energy. I'm, I'm actually an introvert and that can be probably more true um, for introverts. Some extroverts are probably like that too. Um, but it, yeah, it can be not always the easiest situation to be in, but I'm doing it because I wanted to really share with you more of my story. I know that some of you have listened, you know, for a while or, or um, follow me and have read my story. So, you know, kind of the history of what happened to me, but for those that don't, and also um, for those that do kind of understanding some of the other things that have gone into leading me to do the work that I'm doing now. And what really to me was behind, you know, having a massive fibroid in the first place, not just what happened post getting that fibroid out. Um, so I'm going to dive into that today. And then I'm also going to answer some of your questions. I put out a call on social media, just what are some of your pressing hormonal questions. And um, I got a few. I'm only going to do three today because um, they're kind of extensive <laughs> in the answers. And I don't want to keep you on here forever and ever. So I'm going to tackle three of those today and hopefully help you out. Some of you out there that um, are having these same issues because on the whole, what underlies, you know, one hormonal issue kind of underlies them all. And there's really some basics to go back to no matter what you're experiencing. But let me actually start with my story first. So I took some notes here because that's um, helpful for me in order to remind me um, what I want to cover. So, you know, I really have talked, as I mentioned, pretty openly about my uh, fibroid surgery gone awry and the impact that that has had on my life. You know, it completely um, made me get rid of my previous career, which was a dance instructor and performer. For those that don't know, I've been doing that. I had been doing that for about seven plus years here in Asheville, North Carolina, and really, you know, focused on working with women who maybe traditionally did not dance um, or weren't accepted kind of in the old paradigm of dance communities, which has a very specific idea of what women's bodies should look like in order to you know, be a dancer and training and all those kinds of things. So um, I really wanted to create a, a dance, you know, opportunity for women that would not have traditionally had the opportunity not to just come in and dance in class and feel comfortable which is you know de definitely a basic and was very important but also to take it onto the stage and perform because I found that in performing we really connect to a side of us that most most of the time we have hidden and this is why <laughs> artists continue to uh, put their heart and soul into performance when they're not really getting paid very well for that, right? And so really having that opportunity to create something, to learn it, to practice. I mean, so much of the power of, of anything really is in the practice. I know we don't like to think that way. We want to get to that end goal, but really it's so much in the practice. And then you have, you know, ultimately at this few minutes on stage, but it can really... Um, change your, your life in some deep and profound ways. And it can connect you to 
parts of yourself that may have been hidden, maybe you didn't know were there. Um, and I have found it really boosted the confidence of so many of the women that were were with me um, on that journey. So that's what I was doing before I found out I had this fibroid, very large fibroid, um, rel let's say relatively large fibroid. I know a lot of women with much larger fibroids. So mine was about six centimeters when I had the ultrasound. So I actually discovered it myself. I could not get my Diva Cup all the way in one month. And you know, immediately you think, oh my God, this is cancer. You know, that's kind of where your brain goes. And when I found out that it was a fibroid, I didn't really know much about fibroids beforehand. And I've found that that's true for most women. Most of us haven't really heard about fibroids until you have one. Then, <laughs> then you learn all the things about fibroids. Um, but, you know, of course, I was uh, grateful that it wasn't cancer and that it, you know, it was this essentially benign uh, fibroids are benign tumors, essentially. They're cancerous less than 0.5% of the time. Um, and they're super common. You know, some statistics say 80% of women will have at least one by the time they're 50. Um, other statistics say that black women will actually, uh, ha it's 90% um, likelihood that they will have um, a fibroid. And there's not a lot that's being, you know, done around that with the exception of surgery. Um, my first option was to take an estrogen suppressant. And this kind of basically kicks you into early menopause. And I did know enough then to know that I was not ready to go into early menopause. And for me, you know, the issue wasn't oh my God, I want to have kids. You know, I, I actually don't have children and I um, haven't ever wanted to have children. And so I didn't have to think about it from that perspective, but it was very interesting to see how the doctors, once they learned that and my age, which was, um, I guess, 38 at the time. Yeah, I'm 40 now. So, um, or 39, I was 39 it was last year. So, you know, immediately when I said that I didn't want kids, it was, okay, well, let's do a hysterectomy. And um, neither of those choices, either the estrogen suppressant or um, a hysterectomy sounded good to me. And I had already done some research, so I knew about what I ended up actually getting eventually, which was a laparoscopic myomectomy. And so what that is, if you haven't heard of that, is they you know, essentially do three to four small incisions in your abdomen, and they go in and they cut the fibroid or fibroids. Often there's more than one, if you have a large one um, happening already. They go in, they cut them out, and um, to protect you in case it is cancerous, because they cannot test it, they can't do a biopsy until they get it out, they essentially kind of have a balloon inside of you, and they put the fibroid inside of the balloon and then cut it up inside of that balloon and then pull it out of your body that way. And I did my research. I talked to several women who had had the procedure done and you know for them it had been kind of a miracle I mean they were you know downtime of a week maybe two and um, they had had serious problems with the fibroid as many women do once they grow large before that and so to me this sounded like the best answer um, and I was unable to do it here in Asheville because there's only one doctor that does it here. And I won't go into the whole long story of why that is. And I couldn't get in with him for months. So I ended up getting an appointment at a place that I will not mention that name of, but let's just say it's one of the premier centers for gynecological surgeries for minimally invasive gynecological surgeries here in the Southeast. And I, you know, got an appointment there and uh, went and met with my surgeon twice beforehand. And, you know, it seemed like it was a pretty easy thing. I, I mean, I do remember the surgeon telling me that uh, myomectomies are a little bit more complicated than hysterectomies. And, you know, over time, I kind of learned that that's true from the doctor's perspective, not necessarily more complicated for us. But... <laughs> The, the hysterectomy would have been a day surgery, you know, in and out in a day. And the myomectomy, they do keep you overnight because of, I guess, uh, 
more possible complications of bleeding and uh, specifically was what, what they talked about. So, you know, I was like, yep, I want to do the myomectomy and not the hysterectomy. I knew enough already then that, you know, our uterus isn't just for having children. Um, it is, I mean, we're finding out more and more now, especially how much is connected to our brain health. And as we age, you know, and our hormones change, we know that estrogen plays a huge role in brain health and memory and also in bone health. You know, osteoporosis is such a common thing for women to develop in their menopausal years or postmenopausal years because of the impact that estrogen had on um, their bone health and how estrogen drop, drops at menopause. And, you know, so there's definitely some studies now saying that um, hormone replacement therapy, and I'm talking about, you know, bioidentical, and most estrogen at this point actually is bioidentical, even if you go to a regular doctor, um, versus it used to be from horses urine years ago. And that's when all of the um, studies were done on HRT, which stands for hormone replacement therapy. And they were, you know, having to stop it because um, women were developing cancer at alarming rates. So at that point, estrogen was derived from horse's urine and progesterone is actually, when you go to a regular doctor, allopathic doctor, it is a chemical form. It's not our, it's not the same as the form that we make in our bodies. Um, and it's actually called progestin, but your doctor will more than likely call it progesterone. They think of it as one and the same. Um, hormone experts uh, will hopefully let you know that they are two different things. Um, the chemical makeup of our own progesterone, which is what you find in bioidentical progesterone, is very different than progestin. So anyways, I you know, was in this place of just kind of deciding on the surgery, and it seemed like such a, an easy easy answer. You know, it's like, okay, well, I'm a dancer. I need to be able to get back to dancing. This, they didn't have to open me up. Um, I'd never had surgery before. And yet, you know, I've known people that have had surgery and everyone comes out just fine. So it was kind of a no brainer for me. I said, let's do this. Um, and, you know, I'd done my research, obviously, as a holistic health practitioner, I wanted to know the natural ways to deal with this. And you know, what I was finding was that people said pretty much once it, it, the fiber gets like four to five centimeters, that it's really hard to shrink it after that, you know, and I don't know if I agree with that at this point. I think that there's a lot that you can do, but there is a certain point where it um, can be hard to shrink it. And at the same time, let me just note, you can actually diminish the symptoms of the fibroid tremendously, even if it doesn't shrink. There's a lot that can be done around that. And then, you know, sometimes it shrinks too. So um, anyways, all of this, I didn't, I didn't, you know, know at the time. And I decided to do the surgery. It happened in June of last year. And right after the surgery, you know, it's, it's such a weird thing to think back on um, because, you know, I knew something was wrong that next morning because I, I got up to get ready to leave. My parents were coming to pick me up and I just... I, I felt like I had to just, I was so nauseous. And, you know, the food that I had eaten, um, they want you to eat relatively quickly after the surgery. The food that I had eaten, I just felt gross after it and just didn't feel good. Um, you know, but that's, that can be a normal thing after surgery, you know, particular abdominal surgery. And I realized over time how close our reproductive system is to our colon. So it's very much impactful on that. But the next morning I got up, got out of bed, and I just I thought I was gonna just heave all over the place. And I went to the bathroom and um, you know, tried, tried to throw up and, and nothing came out, but it was the most excruciating pain I've ever experienced. Well, I guess I probably ended up experiencing more excruciating pain over time, but at that point, um, I really felt almost like, you know, something's broken inside of me. 
the nurse came back in. She had already, you know, removed my IV and she was like, what happened? And I, I told her, I was like, I'm in so much pain. And she's like, well, you know, I don't know what to do. And finally she said, okay, well, I'm going to put the IV back in and give you, I think it was morphine. And then, um, that didn't help. And then she was able to give me a muscle relaxant and over time that helped enough. So I continued with my checking out process and I went home and, you know, the first couple of days are definitely a blur, but probably by day three or four, I was up and moving around, but really I was already, you know, kind of struggling maybe more than I should have been because at that point, mostly after laparoscopic surgery, and I've, I've learned this since personally, because when my laparoscopic surgery went well, I was actually doing great on day two. So by day three or four, I should have been doing better, but I didn't know at the time. And you know, this is what we do as women, right? And this is one of the things I tell women all the time when they contact me about surgery and you know, if they're gonna get the fibroid surgery or done, done or not. You know, I say, first of all, go into it believing fully that it is gonna be the best thing for your body. And then two, if you do not feel right within a couple of days, you know, I mean, you're going to have some pain, obviously, but if you, if something really feels off, go to the ER, you know, let your surgeon know, don't mess around, say, you know, say, I know a woman who ended up having sepsis because of getting burned during a surgery. I mean, use me <laughs> and push that through and say, you understand the threat of sepsis. Um, so, you know, just really, if I had had that information beforehand, um, that I could even get sepsis, I didn't, I didn't know that. And I don't think most women know that, which I'll go into in a second, but, you know, it was it, within a few more days after that, I was, um, the pain meds weren't working. And so they changed the pain meds that I was on. It's just, you know, working with the nurses at the place that I had gotten my surgery done. And then it was getting to the point where I was nauseous off of drinking water. Um, I had to get up four times a night to take hot showers because that was the only thing that would calm down the pain um, on my kind of right side back and, and the right side. My mom was staying with me and she was giving me, you know, constant massages with a muscle relaxant, um, uh, you know, the kind of uh, ointment or whatever that, that helps to relax your muscles in it. And, you know, it was all sort of temporary fixes, but I kept thinking, oh, I'm, you know, I'm getting better. It's, it's going to um, wake up tomorrow and it's going to feel better. But really, it just was getting worse. And finally, and mind you, I had three conversations with nurses where I had gotten my surgery done. And they had told me things like, you know, some of the, the incision, um, which I had started raising, that, that was just scar tissue. Um, but I knew by that kind of last night before I went to the hospital that, that I had an infection. It had raised enough to where I knew that. And so I didn't sleep a wink that night. I was in so much pain. And first thing in the morning, I had my mom take me to the um, local uh, kind of urgent care clinic. And thank God that doctor there was on top of his game because he basically took one look at me and you know, looked at um, my, my resting heart rate, it's extremely high, um, and he just knew I had sepsis. And it's pretty amazing because my temperature was actually normal and my blood pressure was normal. And I later learned from another nurse that that's um, kind of what happens in stage two of sepsis. Stage one, you're gonna be having you know, these um, you're going to have elevated temps. You're going to have elevated blood pressure as your body's fighting. And looking back, that was happening in my body, but I just didn't know it at the time. Um, but once it gets to stage two, it's kind of at this point where um, it's not even fighting that battle anymore. You know, it's, it's kind of starting to lose. And once you get past that point, your organs start shutting down. And so... I was right on that verge of my organs starting to shut down. And, you know, thank God for that, that doctor that took one look at me and looked at my resting heart rate and knew that I needed to go to the ER and that I more than likely had sepsis. So I went, I 
to her, you know, he said, go directly to the ER. He actually called the hospital here and told them that I was coming and explained what was going on. And, you know, I had a full day in that ER of testing and them thinking, you know, okay, so it's gynecologically related because she just had this gynecological surgery to determining that, no, nope, it was definitely you know, intestinal related and that um, we had to go in and figure out um, what was going on. They essentially knew that there was leaks happening, you know, it's what they call them, abscesses and um, breaks in, in your gut, essentially. And I had all of this stool and liquid and bacteria that was dumping into my abdominal cavity, you know, and they did what they could to kind of get all that out. But then they said, well, we have to go in and figure out where this is coming from, where this is dumping into your abdomen. So I went into exploratory surgery that night. Um, and during that same surgery, you know, they cleaned me out as much as they could. And then they, um, they found the three places that I was burned to um, one in my lower small intestine near the end and one at the kind of beginning of my colon, my ascending colon, which, you know, makes a lot of sense because that's where they went in for the original fibroid surgery. So the third one was actually up on my transverse colon, which is kind of, you yeah, near um, kind of under your, your breastbone you know, under under there and so it was way far away from the other spaces um, so we don't really know to this day exactly what happened there um, there's uh, the hypothesis that the tool that was used to cut up the fiber it actually sparked and sparks flu we don't i don't know if i'll ever know maybe i'll do some regression therapy at some point with someone and try and figure that out but I, you know, went, went under that night, not really knowing um, anything other than I was in such incredible pain. And the first thing I remember is two days later. Um, and during that first surgery, they had given me, or they had cut out a good chunk of my colon um, after they found the three places I was burned because they couldn't salvage my colon. So I lost all of my ascending and half of my transverse colon about 40% or so in all. And then I lost about eight inches of my small intestine. And that includes the ileocecal valve for those of you that are into gut stuff. It's a very um, important protection for bacteria to not travel back up into your small intestine from your colon. And, you know, particularly with something called SIBO, which is small intestine bacterial overgrowth, um, that's one of the big issues that, um, that practitioners will look at is a ileocecal valve in this, uh, dysfunction. And so I don't have one period <laughs> at this point. Um, but that's another story for another day. So during that surgery, that's everything that I, I was taken out and they basically left me open to perform uh, the next surgery about a day, day and a half later. And that's where they formed an ileostomy and also mucus fistula for me. So technically, I actually had two ostomies. So an ileostomy, for those that don't know, is when they pull the end of your small intestine outside of your abdomen, you know, so it's on the outside of your body. And basically, this is where you defecate. Um, and you wear a, a bag, an ostomy bag, in order for the, your... Um, we. When you have an ostomy, you call it output. You don't really call it stool. Um, that's where your output goes into. Um, and you have to basically, you know, dump the bag a whole lot. <laughs> if you have an ileostomy, dump the bag a lot each day um, because things don't bulk up until they get to your colon. So it's pretty much just liquid. And if you're lucky, you get it to a toothpaste consistency, but it's constant and you have to get up in the middle of the night and go dump the bag. And then you have to, have to actually change the bag every three to four days. Um, well, some people can get longer. I was like, oh, making noises. Um, I was able at some points to do maybe five or six days, but um, three or four days kind of over time was what, um, how often I had to change it. And it was um, 
such a, an incredible experience, right? I mean, how many people live their life with their intestine on the outside of their body? It's kind of amazing that we can, you know? Um, and, you know, yeah, how many people live that way? And then, you know, on the other side of that, there's a lot of people that actually have ostomies that um, we never know because people really try and hide them. And I tried to really showcase mine as much as possible to let people know that it was okay to do that and that, that your body is still okay and a beautiful thing, you know, and um, pretty amazing to be able to survive that and, you know, have everything, have the, that sort of main way of getting rid of waste outside of your body. And then eventually for many uh, with ostomies, you know, not everybody can get what is called reversed, but for many they can. And that's when they essentially put that intestine, whether it's your small intestine with an ileostomy or your colon, if you have a colostomy, they put it back in and then sew you and staple you back together. So for me, that meant sewing my small intestine to the remaining of my colon. And what's crazy about that is that you, you know, I mean, I think probably about eight hours after that surgery, I had a bowel movement and I passed gas probably three hours afterwards. And I know that's not something you normally talk about in mixed company, but when you have an ostomy and when you're getting reversal surgery, let me tell you, everybody is on board with you passing gas and having a bowel movement because that means that everything is working correctly. You know, that's actually what will get you out of the hospital. They keep you um, until you do both. Um, to make sure everything's working correctly. So um, it's definitely a flip on the head of how we normally kind of process dealing with our excrement. But yeah, I remember, I'll never forget how um, happy the, the nurse was for me when I passed gas and when I had the bowel movement. I was like, yay, you know, only time in history you'll really share that on purpose. So anyways, um, you know, I went through this obviously very traumatic situation um, and nearly lost my life. Um, you know, those two days I was in the ICU, kind of um, in, in between surgeries, and then I was in the ICU, I think, for about three more days after that. You know, it was very touch and go. And this is something I think women need to understand is a possibility. And I don't say any of this to discourage any woman from getting surgery if you absolutely need it. You know, I mean, there are definitely cases where you absolutely need it. Um, and many surgeries go just fine, you know, and go well. But we are not really talking about the times that they don't. And that happens more often than most of us realize. And I learned that not only from what I went through. So I will admit what I went through is very unique. Um, I have yet to meet another woman who was burned in multiple places in her intestines. <laughs> Lucky me, right? The, the uniqueness factor in that. But I have talked with numerous women who were um, what we will call nicked during surgery um, and unknowingly nicked and, you know, sewed back up or, um, you know, with laparoscopy, they just kind of, um, kind of usually just glue the, the incisions together um, with no knowledge that that happened, that they were nicked. And, you know, it could be intestines, it could be bladder. And this is something that should be talked about a whole lot more because most of the women that that happens to, they end up with an ostomy bag and they end up with sepsis and hospitals and doctors are not taking their symptoms seriously when they, you know, let them know that we still live in a culture that does not believe women in their pain. And so like me, you know, I mean, I had nurses telling me, Oh, you know, it's scar tissue forming or, you know, just give it another day, this kind of stuff, and it, without taking it seriously. And I nearly died because of that. And there are a lot of women out there that nearly died because of it. And so I want us to be talking about that because if you are going to have surgery, you need to know about these things and so that you're ready and prepared if something does happen because time is of the essence, particularly with sepsis. You know, your chances of dying from sepsis 
increase 8% an hour. I don't know how long I had it. My guess is, you know, maybe a couple of days. I was definitely fighting infection the whole time, but by the time it turned to sepsis, my guess is probably, you know, two to three days, but who, who knows? I mean, there's people that live a lot longer with sepsis than, um, than we think is possible. But, you know, to understand what can happen and to get assistance immediately, um, you know, if I had <clears throat> been told by those nurses to go to the ER, you know, um, I probably would have saved my colon. I would have saved, I may have, ha I probably would have still had to have surgery, but um, maybe not. They might have been able to do, you know, IV antibiotics and keep me not eating for a few days and it might have healed itself. Our bodies are miraculous if they, you know, have the chance. Um, but even if I'd had to have surgery, I don't think I would have had to lose any of my colon or my small intestine or have an ostomy bag. Um, and you know, I, I think that just there's so many little things that can be done to to shift the situation. You know, when I was talking to my eventual colorectal specialist, which is the surgeon that did my reversal surgery and put me back together again, put Humpty Dumpty back together again, as I always say, you know, he told me, he said, you know, it is a, a well-known complication that... Um, you can get nicked during a surgery. And he said, you know, as you well know, <laughs> and we talked openly and honestly about that. And one of the things that he and I believe a resident there told me is that, you know, the difference kind of between gynecological surgeries and, and these colon surgeries with colorectal specialists is that they know about this possibility and such a, it's so much at the forefront of their mind that they're constantly, as they do their work, looking to see if there was any kind of nick that happened. So they can deal with it right in the moment, you know. And I wasn't nicked as far as we know. Um, you know, it, 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 I mean, the guesses from the ER surgeons were, were burns. Um, but if they had done something, which they do in colon surgery, which is after they fix everything, they actually run, you know, some kind of fluid through your colon to make sure that there's no leaks. And I don't understand, since we know how common it can be and that it's a very well-known complication that a woman can get nicked in a local or organ during a gyno surgery, why we aren't doing that same kind of test. Because if they had run a test, you know, and, and had fluid going through my um, my intestines, then more than likely that would have shown up. There would have been, you know, the escape of, of some of that fluid into my abdominal cavity, and we could have dealt with it right then. And so there's so many levels to this. There's so many things that I just want people to understand going into these surgeries, and ultimately knowing, you know, to back it up to the fibroid, it's it's not your body hating you. Your body is not against you. There is a hormonal imbalance situation going on when you have a fibroid. End of case. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it just, it's incredible to me that you will go to a doctor and they will say, they know very well that fibroids, you know, usually shrink when you hit menopause because of the drop in estrogen. And they obviously will put you on estrogen um, lowering medication or, um, in order to, to kind of fight the fibroid, right? And yet they don't really see it as, let's look at your hormones as a whole and figure out what's going on here and work on that because that is the underlying component. And then an extension of that is your gut. Because if your gut's not working, your hormones are going to be not working properly too. Um, and this is what I hope for the future is that, you know, um, functional medicine practitioners and, um, you know, integrative practitioners and nutritionists that understand this work will be able to come together with doctors more um, so that both of these sides can be taken care of. Um, and that when women come in with fibroids or ovarian cysts or some of these other major problems around their cycle and their reproductive system, 
that they'll have the option to first see, okay, dietary, gut, liver health, doing these changes to see what happens. And, you know, understanding, I mean, something as simple as, you know, where are your vitamin D levels, your B12 levels, your iron levels, all of that plays a huge role and it's easy to test for. Um, to start with it, that before going to surgery or to suppress your estrogen. Um, and, you know, same thing goes with using birth control. Um, there's so many other options that we can, you know, do for the symptoms of menstrual hell, <laughs> which so many women experience. So that's kind of my story. Um, I will just add about the fibroid, you know, is that it's not, it's not just hormone balancing, <laughs> having said all that, you know, it's a huge um, important part of it, but it's really the life that you lead that leads to hormonal imbalance. You know, it's diet, it's liver health, it's your microbiome, and I'll be answering some of that or alluding to some of that in one of the questions I'll be answering here from, from a listener. But, um, you know, it, it, there's spiritual components and there are um, lifestyle components that are huge and really stress is such a, has such a huge impact. I can't even begin to, you know, make a finer point here than the levels of stress that women are experiencing are completely showing up in our bodies and showing up as reproductive issues, autoimmune issues, all kinds of illnesses and diseases that we're seeing. Our bodies are not meant to handle all the things that we're throwing at it on a daily basis without self-care involved. And I'm not just talking about, you know, a massage here and there. I'm talking daily self-care. I'm talking boundaries. I'm talking setting boundaries. And this was one of my biggest issues. I had a horrible, horrible time setting boundaries, particularly in my business. Um, you know, I wanted so much to support women in their own growth that I did not do what I needed to do in, in my growth um, and really setting up boundaries. You know, I think when you have, and I'm speaking kind of to the entrepreneurs who are listening, the female entrepreneurs, when you have your own business, you feel like you always have to give, you always have to do more. There's no stopping point, you know, because you're trying to build this thing and you're trying to get your name out there and you're trying to connect with people and you're just trying to take care of biz, you know, you're trying to pay your bills. And so it's this constant give. And the thing is your body can't handle that. It is a miraculous thing, but it needs rest and repair in order to work properly. That is just evolution. That is just our biology. You know, we were not evolved to have this constant um, stress, constant, you know, technology, constant lights on. It just throws everything off, right? And when you don't set those boundaries, even in something that is your own then it will, it will undoubtedly show up in your body. And I know this is hard. I have, you know, a couple of clients right now that they know that their work and they're not entrepreneurs, but that the work that they're doing is not, is not supportive of their physical or emotional health, but it's a really hard thing to, to get out of the work that they're doing, you know, and, and I get it. Safety and security play huge roles. I trust me, I get it in such a big way. That's been a constant source of struggle for me for, for a few years now. But the reality is that sometimes we absolutely have to like throw the, throw it in the fire and just walk away. I mean, it, sometimes it takes extreme measures in order to really give our body what it needs. And I know a lot of people listening may be like, yeah, I can't do that, you know? And what I implore for you to do, so hopefully you don't have to like get the dumpster fire going and just jet out of there, is to start to make these changes right now, um, small changes by setting boundaries, even in your work, you know, even when you think that you can't do it, I guarantee there are definitely spaces and places that you can. Um, and the more that you do it, the more you work that muscle, then the more confidence I think you have to 
um, you know, do follow the path of what maybe your soul really wants for you and to do the work that you really want to be doing in the world. You know, it doesn't happen overnight. I mean, I know that for sure, but I believe that our bodies as women on the whole are going through all of this kind of pain and illness and disease right now because they're calling us to make the deepest changes and sacrifices out in the world in order to give to ourselves. And that's what we need. I mean, we have generations of women that have been fighting the good fight. And I believe it's time that we do that inside of ourselves to really take care of ourselves so that we can create this different world that most of us, many of us, I'll say, want to be living in. And so just really think about boundaries in your life. I, you know, contemplate that over this more quiet time of year where you can start to set up those boundaries and give yourself space, space to just be, space to sit, sit, space to connect with other people on a different level to, you know, for me taking time to kind of disconnect from my brain is what I call it daily um, is really important. And whether that's, you know, five minutes or really I need 15 to 20 minutes. And for me, listening to, you know, some meditation music or visualization helps that, but it's, it's all individual and you have to really figure it out on your own, but making it a practice that you do daily and creating the boundaries in your life that enable you to actually do the things you actually really want to be doing. Because so much of what you're doing often is not what you want to be doing. You're doing it because you think you should. Let that go as much as you can. So that's enough probably on my story for today um, and kind of my thoughts around a lot of that um, purpose of what I, you know, why I went through that and um, my thoughts obviously on how some things can change. And, and hopefully you know, I'll be talking more about that in 2020. So, but now let's talk about the questions that I got um, from some people. So I'm gonna be I'm just looking here at these questions, doing my best to answer them. Um, so one person wrote in, what is the first thing I should do to deal with my excruciating PMS? Very good question. So. There's not an easy answer to this, um, but I kind of alluded to some of this in what I was just talking about, you know, in terms of hormonal balance. So you really absolutely need to start with your gut. And I know that this is not a popular answer. I know that most of us want, you know, one kind of pill and that can be a supplement or several supplements or, you know, um, hormone, bioidentical hormone replacement or uh, any of these things to be sort of the answer. And that is not the case. Our gut underlies our hormones and you have to, have to, have to work on your gut in order for your hormones to um, have a real chance, really, you know. So one of, one of the things that so many people experience, so many women experience without realizing it, and you know, men too, but in this case, we're talking about women's hormones, is leaky gut. And um, this leads to inflammation. And inflammation directly impacts our hormones. It actually messes essentially with our estrogen receptors. Um, it also impacts our you know, microbiome. So when you have leaky gut, often um, there's, there's some, there's issue in your, in your microbiome, which if you don't know your microbiome, it's essentially, most people are referring to, you know, what's happening, the good and the bad bacteria that's happening in your colon. Um, it can extend to your small intestine, although our small intestine should be, as far as we know now, a relatively low in bacteria. And that's why things like SIBO, are such an issue because you have these bacteria in your small intestine that aren't supposed to be there. So when your microbiome is thrown off and this happens through, you know, uh, many things, including birth control, uh, pills, which most women have been on at some point in their life, antibiotics, which most of us have been on multiple times in our life, um, pesticides that are in our food, 
Um, you know, there's so many different ways that our microbiome is impacted. And if you have too much of those uh, sort of bad buggers going on and not enough of the good ones to balance things out, that can wreck some serious havoc. And leaky gut plays um, a massive role in that too, allowing, you know, pathogens to get through the gut lining and into your bloodstream. And we don't like them there. Um, and your body has to be in constant fight mode when that's, you know, happening. And also allows pathogens to really set up in your, your colon or your stomach, you know, or your small intestine for the long term. And for example, I recently found out I have H. pylori, which is in your stomach. And that, um, my guess is I've had that for many years. And one of the things that it does is you know, creates acid reflux, or it's an underlying component of acid reflux and GERD and heartburn, um, and none of which I have, but about 50% of people are asymptomatic um, when they have high levels of H. pylori. So the big thing for me is that it diminished my, um, my acid output. And um, I've known that. I've known that my hydrochloric acid was low, and I've supplemented for a few years with that, but never really thought about you know, H. pylori being an issue for me. So this is why, you know, it's so important when you have that microbiome thrown off, part of the microbiome is something we call a strobilome. And this essentially helps to detox or move um, what has been detoxified by our liver, move that estrogen out of our body. So our liver actually has to detox estrogen um, because it's it's not a good situation when it doesn't, you know, and it, it um, leads to estrogen dominance, too much estrogen in our bodies. It's really, um, I don't want to necessarily say poisonous, but it's really not good for our bodies to have too much estrogen. And so the liver um, detoxes that, but it goes to the back of the line when your liver is dealing with things like, uh, alcohol, I was about to say liquor, but yes, liquor and all alcohol, um, caffeine, um, prescription and non-prescription drugs, um, you know, uh, all kinds of drugs. And so when your estrogen goes to the back of the line, that is going to cause issues. So, you know, the second component really is looking at your, at your liver, but going back to your estrobilum, after your liver has detoxified the, the estrogen, and it moves moves it down to your colon. Um, that is where you know it's it's in this bound form to move out of your body via your stool. And if your strobilum is off, then often what can happen is what is called deconjugation of your estrogen. So it's you know essentially been um, brought down to a safe kind of level. Um, and, you know, attached in this way that is protective to you to get it out of your body. But then when your shovelin is messed up, it, it breaks that, that bond that is, has kept that for safe exit of your estrogen. And so this allows your estrogen to actually recirculate in your body, um, giving you higher estrogen levels and um, estrogen dominant issues, which doesn't underlie every um, hormonal issue, but it does a lot, <laughs> a lot, a lot, especially if you're, you know, kind of in the your perimenopausal years or getting into your perimenopausal years. So yeah, healing the leaky gut is huge, huge, huge. Um, you know, not only on the estrogen that I mentioned, but also with things like melatonin and serotonin, which you know, we know now somewhere between 80 and 95% of our serotonin is produced in our gut. So issues with, um, you know, depression and other um, mental illnesses can be in part because of this, your messed up gut. It's just, you know, it's crazy how it oversees everything. Um, not to mention that bacteria in your gut can speak to your brain. So it's pretty crazy. Um, you know, what I would say first is obviously to focus on what you're eating. I mean, literally every one of us can clean up our diet in some way or form, you know, and I'm not going to say that there's one diet that's best for everyone, but I do see that many, many people 
have blood sugar issues and that is has kind of a cascade effect on your hormones so get really clear on be honest with yourself like okay maybe you don't eat much you know refined sugar but you eat a lot of chips or a lot of crackers and i don't care if they're gluten-free that's still that is impacting your blood sugar um you know are you getting enough good quality protein are you getting enough good fats are you eating enough vegetables that helps your microbiome you know the the prebiotics that come in certain vegetables like artichokes um, that feeds your good bacteria and that's necessary you can't just dump some good bacteria in your body and hope that it will do okay it needs something to eat so you know all of these things to look at as bases you gotta you gotta do the gluten-free dairy-free thing i mean almost always you know um gluten we're finding that it, it really impacts everybody and you know the why of that is we don't really know it could be the glyphosate it could be you know just how it's been shifted over time um how sort of breads are made all these there's so many different reasons that that it could be an issue now you know versus why it wasn't an issue 50 years ago and, um, and also why a lot of people can say go to Europe and eat bread there and be fine. You know, I mean, there's, there's, yeah, so many levels to it. But when you're healing your gut and when your hormones are out of whack, you got to do it. You just got to do it. it. It changes so much for so many people, especially when it comes to autoimmunity. Um, same thing with dairy. And we know that, you know, the A1 casein in dairy, um, in cow dairy is very inflammatory for most people. Um, so many of us also don't have the enzyme to properly break down lactose. And so, um, yeah, it's just, just cut it out, you know, do those, those two things. Um, look at your sugar. You got to break down the sugar because that sugar is feeding those bad bacteria. And if you have a mess up microbiome, it's just going to keep that essentially messed up, you know, um, getting that sugar down in your diet is such a massive, such a massive impact on all your systems, you know, and I'm never going to say you got to cut it out hundred percent. You know, you have to find your own way with sugar. We all do. I mean, that's been one of my biggest struggles over the years. Um, I feel like just probably in the past few years, maybe like three years, I've kind of gotten to a place with it um, where it doesn't have the same kind of hold on me that it did for a long time, but it's a powerful drug. So be kind to yourself around it, but really look at where can I bring it down? You know, where is it really happening that I don't even realize? What about these sauces that I eat? You know, there's so many sauces that you get from the store, that have tons of sugar in it, you know? Think about the alcohol you drink. That, that, that's sugar. That basically breaks down pretty quickly to sugar in your body. Um, you know, really think about the things that you don't necessarily notice on a daily basis, especially if you, you know, work somewhere and they have snacks in the in the break room um donuts things like that like even if you eat just little pieces of candy here and there you know often that is happening much more than you realize and so really really be honest with yourself around that um and then you really beyond diet it's not just about diet it is about what are your digestion how is your digestion is it working properly and i would say for more than 90 percent of us it's not you know, beyond leaky gut, like what is, how is your HCL levels? How are they doing? Most of us have lowered HCL levels over time. We've just naturally, our bodies produce less as we age. Um, and there's a whole host of issues that can be at play to diminish that, um, that production, you know, including H. pylori, as I mentioned earlier. But if you look at, um, you know, things like gas and bloating, I would say, the majority of the time that is an HCL deficiency. If you have acid reflux, it's actually an HCL deficiency. You know, go back, uh, if you follow me on Instagram, and I did uh, an overview of, of why this is. And I'm not saying take HCL right off the bat. If you have acid reflux, you wanna heal your mucosal lining before you start supplementing with it, but it's actually a low acid problem. We'll just leave it there. And then you're also, you know, if your HCL is low, then your, di your 
I'll call them pancreatic enzymes. You know, people will call them digestive enzymes, but they come from your, from your pancreas. And if your HCL is low, then those will not, um, your pancreas won't be properly triggered to release those. So you almost always have a digestive enzyme, pancreatic enzyme issue. And that's what helps to break down your fats, your carbs, and your protein, and basically be able to get at the nutrients in those for your body to use them. So if you're not doing that, then your body's not getting all the nutrients that it needs. And your hormones are essentially made from those nutrients, you know? It's like all of that has to be broken down properly in order for your hormones to get the food that they need, the nutrients that they need. Um, other things to think about, you know, do you have greasy stools? And that might be an indication of um, bile or uh, gallbladder issues. Um, and then bile comes from your gallbladder. Um, what else? If you're having a lot of diarrhea or constipation or kind of, you know, swing back and forth, you know, that's, that's an indication of a microbiome issue and also probably an inflammatory issue. You know, this is where I like to bring in um, a GI map with clients because we can really see the numbers on what's happening in your diet. We see those inflammation numbers. We see immune system numbers. We see how you're digesting your fats, which will let us know kind of how your gallbladder is doing. Um, it'll tell us the pathogens that you have in your body. So opportunistic bacteria, um, worms, parasites, fungus, and then also levels of good bacteria, which is really important to know. Um, you know, going back to this microbiome, um, a strobilome issue, it also has an indicator on there for what is called your, sometimes called your phase three detox, which um, that, that uh, marker on the GI map is beta glucuronidase. And this is letting us know if you're basically getting that estrogen out of your body. So it's a really important marker on there. Um, and, you know, then you can really focus on the entire digestive system and supporting each aspect of it, you know, support your stomach, support your duodenum, your upper um, small intestine, support your liver and your gallbladder, support your colon, the rest of your small intestine, and then your colon, and, um, you know, just allow for things to kind of move through your system, be broken down, have the gut lining repaired to where things don't go through it into your bloodstream that don't aren't supposed to go there. Um, and it, they, everything changes. It impacts not just your hormones, it impacts your skin in such a huge, huge way. I mentioned recently in an Instagram post about I've had rosacea since my late 20s and I've done everything. And I thought I did some major gut healing, you know, over these years. And until I found out I had this H. pylori and started a protocol on that, I haven't been able to do get anything to work to really diminish my rosacea. And now it's going down. And so it's it's hugely impactful. Um, you know particularly with autoimmune stuff going on, I really highly recommend testing if you can. Um, but going back to this original question, because I went off on a tangent, is, you know, PMS is a sign essentially of imbalanced hormones and you have to get your gut in check first. And often that'll take care of like 90% of it. And then once you've got that taken care of, then you can start to look at, okay, let's see what's happening. You know, if the, that hasn't worked enough, I do recommend um, the Dutch test, which is a dried urine analysis test, hormone test, very comprehensive. It's going to tell you, you know, all of your, your um, sex hormones, estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, DHEA, how they're metabolizing and um, your cortisol levels, which has a huge, huge, huge impact. Um, and so that would be sort of the next step if, if all of taking care of really healing up your gut doesn't do enough. You know, there's um, a few other supportive things you can do for your, for your hormones, you know, in the interim. But that's kind of where I would start without knowing your full story. I won't go into deeper recommendations there. So... Okay, so our second question. I read that you balanced out your hormones at age 40 after all of your surgeries. How did you do that? <laughs> also not a quick and easy answer. Um, 
So I'll start by saying I did have a foundation of really, you know, good eating habits through all of the work that I've done over the years. Um, I did a nutrition education program at Bowman College when I was in my 20s. I got my master's in holistic health education, and we do a lot of nutrition work in that program too. So um, I had a very solid foundation in terms of kind of what, how I needed to eat to help get my hormones in check. Um, and then I used a truckload of supplements <laughs> to build my body back this year. I mean, I'm not even going to lie. It's, there's been a lot of supplements that have passed these lips. Um, and I'm grateful for them. And I'm grateful that I was able to do that because, um, I'm not sure that I could have kind of rebuilt my body without doing that. I've also done, you know, physical things. Um, pelvic floor therapy has been hugely helpful. Um, I do things like uh, what I like to call um, supplemental therapies, um, which include castor oil packs. I do those very consistently. Epsom salt baths. Um, what else? Uh, infrared sauna when I can do that. You know, so th these are all things that are going to support your detox systems to detox extra estrogen, um, which, by the way, I learned that I had. And Oh, I'll get to that in a second, but yeah, so that supports really, you know, your, your detox pathways. It supports, um, your liver, um, castor oil packs can be very helpful for, um, liver detox. And then for me also working on scar tissue, cause that it can help to break those down. Um, with Epsom salts, you're getting that magnesium in that we need, you know, magnesium is used in over 300 processes in the body. None of us have enough. So that can be hugely helpful with that. But one of the big things that was really important in my journey this year of rebalancing my hormones um, was taking the Dutch test, to be honest with you, um, because I found out, you know, how high my estrogen was, um, my estradiol, and which is kind of the main estrogen during premenopausal years. Um, and then I was uh, metabolizing down the more cancerous pathway, which is um, the Dutch test will show you the three pathways that um, the estrogen metabolizes down. And one is 2-OH, one is 4-OH, and one is 16-OH. And 4-OH is known as the more cancerous pathway. And that's where too much of my estrogen was going down and not enough down the 2-pathway, um, which is the, known as the more protective pathway. 16 is often referred to as the proliferative pathway. And I was kind of surprised that I didn't have more going down there. Often, you know, in cases with fibroids and, and cysts and growths and things like that, um, it'll be favoring that pathway. But what was hugely helpful because a lot of women are like, okay, I'm going to take DIM or I'm going to take, you know, calcium glucurate. Um, and particularly with DIM, like if your phase two or phase three detox is not working well, it can cause a whole host of problems and make you feel a whole lot worse. And so, you know, as I mentioned earlier, estrogen, it has to be detoxed by our liver and the liver has two phases of detox, phase one and phase two. And essentially on the Dutch, that first part where it metabolizes is, is telling you, you know, how the phase one is doing. And then it also lets you know how your um, phase two is, is doing. And so from this test, I gathered, that my phase two was doing pretty well. And I learned from the GI map that my phase three, you know, my, the beta glucuronidase was um, in a good place. And so that means I'm getting estrogen out of my body pretty well. Um, but it was my phase one that I needed some real support with. And so um, because I knew phase two and phase three were pretty much good to go, I knew that I could supplement with DIM. Um, and I tend to not recommend doing DIM on its own you know, do um, the calcium glucurate alongside of it. Um, yeah, and that can help with phase two also. And I found a particular supplement that had um, support for your, your liver, your phase one, two um, herbal support alongside of those two. And yeah, I found for me that that's worked really well. I, you do have to figure out... Um, it's trial and error with this stuff sometimes, for sure. I do use muscle testing. I use that for myself. I use it with some of my clients that are, you know, open to it. 
And that has been also very helpful in determining which supplements to take and how much of those supplements to take. And I, I actually test myself pretty consistently um, because I, our needs change. I mean, honestly, they change daily. You know, our hormones change daily. And that's why, you know, t a test isn't a be all end all, but it's, it's a useful tool to kind of give you a snapshot of what's going on. So you kind of know, you know, what areas to begin to work on. And so that was super, super helpful for me um, and surprising in some other ways. Um, and it, you know, it tells you your cortisol, which is so, so important and is often kind of the big shocker, I think, for people when they get the Dutch to see how whacked out their cortisol is, either high or low or kind of bouncing all over the place and not sort of being in the right area at that time of day that it should be in. Um, and so, you know, working with that is going to change your um, your sex hormones a lot because progesterone is very much impacted by, by your cortisol. So that's kind of what I did to help get my hormones in chick, uh, this year. And yeah, lots, lots of, you know, de-stressing and self-care in there too. Um, perspective changes, all of that kind of stuff. Um, I do, I will say I do use a little bit of bioidentical progesterone and I, you know, kind of determine that via muscle testing. Um, and I only use it during my, the luteal phase, but yeah, basically at this point I am back on a, you know, 29 to 30 day, um, cycle, which I had for probably about seven years in my thirties. Um, it really got thrown off when I was developing the fibroid, which I didn't know was developing at the time. Um, and you know, kind of, um, it lasts maybe about four days and I don't have cramps. Um, I don't have PMS issues. So it is possible even at age 40, after you've been through multiple surgeries that, you know, I will say that a lot of times people will get fibroids removed and their estrogen will go down because estrogen does, um, essentially fibroids feed off estrogen and then it puts out estrogen too. It's, it's a nasty little um, situation going on there, but it, that doesn't mean that you are going to have this hormonal balance after you get the fibroid out. So, you know, initially, obviously I did not have a period for probably about four months after my surgeries because I went through much more trauma than what you typically would go through with getting your fibroid removed and that throws your hormones. I mean, I was 91 pounds, so I, you know, was sort of a child in, in my hormones at that point. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I see that women often feel much better, uh, you know, within the couple months, three, four or five months after the fibroid surgery, but then fibroids often grow back and it's because they are not at that surgery did not balance your hormones. It may have brought your estrogen levels down temporarily because you don't have that fibroid kind of feeding off of it and putting it back into your body, but it's gonna, you know, come in, um, it's going to come back in another way if you don't deal with the underlying components. Xenoestrogens is another one, but I won't go into that right now. So last question. Uh, we're trying to, let's see how long this thing is. I can't tell. So if whoever's still with me, um, last question, I miss my libido. What can I do? Oh yeah, this is a big one. I know that from personal experience that mine was gone, 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 gone after for a long time after my surgeries. Um, so I would say this is an instance where working with a practitioner and ordering a Dutch can be really helpful because libido can be you know, several different things going on. Sometimes it's um, lower testosterone, sometimes it's lowered DHEA, sometimes a combination of the two. Um, in you know, some situations it's low progesterone and um, you know, sometimes women will take the bioidentical progesterone and notice their libido kicks up really, really well. Um, other times, not so much. Um, it can also be way too high of estrogen. So there's so many different reasons that that could be happening that this is when I think testing is a really good thing because, you know, you think, oh, I'll just try progesterone. But if testosterone is the issue or DHEA is the issue, then you could be, you know, exacerbating the situation by just doing bioidentical progesterone. So this is why I really think it's important, um, particularly when you start talking about supplementing with actual hormones um, to, to get testing done. What else? Um, 
just some basic things um, before you get testing done that you can do is a make sure you get enough sleep hugely impactful on our libido um, do some weight training that's been you know shown to increase testosterone and so um, sometimes that can kick up libido for for people i've seen that happen um, it's pretty amazing exercise is pretty amazing let me let me remind you about that you know i don't talk about it a lot but it's a huge 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 um, impact on our hormones and our health as a whole and not about you know making us lose weight it's it literally i mean it helps even from the pathogenic perspective it helps to you know basically kill off pathogens um, it helps to um, you know impact your hormones by something as simple as lifting weights like it's it's an incredible thing and you know we there's so much research coming out now about how it impacts our our brain function and our um, our happiness index. So yeah, try and lift some weights and see if that helps at all. Um, thyroid, checking out your thyroid, that can uh, often be a sort of hidden issue and knowing what optimal levels of thyroid look like. So not just your TSH, but your your free T4, your free T3, um, reverse T3, some people like to really look at, and also your thyroid antibodies. So getting the whole panel together um, and understanding where, where it should be, not just the reference ranges. Stress levels, um, I can't, you know, here I am back at the stress levels. That undoubtedly is almost always a part of the situation. So your stress, you are not going to be wanting to get it on. I can tell you, you know, I mean, maybe there's a few people out there that kind of thrive under that, um, under the stress and are like, let's do this thing. But in general, that's not true for women. And when we have too many things happening, we're just like, I don't think so. You know, you're like, I'm just trying to get some sleep here. So stress. So those are the places that I would start. All right, guys. That's going to be it for today. But, you know, I'd love to do this again in the future and answer some questions. So you can send them to me. Um, you should be able to access my information, I believe, on my on the show notes. Well, I'll put, I'll put information there so you can send me a message. Um, and I really, I hope that you have a, an amazing holiday, you know, season, whatever you celebrate or don't celebrate. Um, hopefully you get some quiet time in there. Hopefully you get some connection time. I'm actually looking at my 41st birthday. So I'm a Christmas baby and I will be 41. And it's been, you know, a fascinating year on so many levels. Um, and I really look forward to seeing what 41 brings. And I look forward to connecting with you more. Um, I, I love the connection that I'm you know, have been slowly building with, with women out in the world um, and seeing you go through shifts and changes. And um, I know it's not all been easy, but it is beautiful to watch. Um, and really you taking control of your health because we're the only ones that ultimately have control of our own health. And we're the ones, only ones that are really going to care about it in a big way. And so, you know, I want to be here to support you in that journey. So I look forward to more of that in 2020. Have a wonderful holiday season and a wonderful new year. And I will see you on the other side. Bye.